Um, I am, as it says, actually it doesn't say, I am a big data researcher, which is a very fancy way of saying I hunch in front of a laptop and I look at large sets of economic data and then we work with a whole bunch of really smart people and we write research papers and we try to push governments in Asia and Africa to basically do what we want. Um, I am a writer, which is hopefully why most of you guys are here. Um, I have written two books. Actually, this thing went down. Okay. Can you guys hear me? You all in the back? Perfect, right? Okay, wonderful. Uh, written, I published two books. The first was Suicide of Rohan Vijayaratna. It's about this alcoholic asshole who uh, ends up shooting himself into a black hole and being very pleasant in the because he wants to commit suicide in a very dramatic The second is my debut novel. So since I'm, my voice is more reliable, I'm going with it. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so my debut novel basically, um, that, that short story, oh, thanks for that. So that short story that I wrote surprisingly broke um, Amazon US, it went to number one on hard sci-fi, it hit literary fiction, uh, and the debut novel that I also launched um, basically went on and it hit number one in hard sci-fi in cyberpunk and basically broke the bestseller list and so on and so forth. And this was interesting because this was like a, as a writer, I, I launched these two things like three or four months apart. And as a writer, you're generally supposed to write a book and then you're supposed to sit in front of the typewriter and lead and then collect rejection letters. And then you're supposed to talk about it, how hard writing is, at Gawlit Vesta, whatever, you're supposed to say, oh my God, I waited years to publish or whatever. So I just said, screw it to the system. And I found ways where I could put my work out there with a minimum of time investment on my side and basically get in there. So, I have no great insight to give you today, but I'm going to tell you a story, because that's what I apparently do for a living these days. And hopefully you can get something from it, and hopefully at the end of it you will have questions to ask me, so that I can pretend to have an intelligent speech or something planned here, right? So I grew up rich, um, father's from TS State money, uh, I went to an international school, Three guys and 13 girls in my class, it was fantastic. Um, so, I want to be an astronaut and I would spend all my time basically memorizing the positions of the stars and how many light years from Earth and so on and so forth. And then my father said, you're wearing glasses. Yeah, you're not an American. Yeah, you're never going to go to space. I said, okay, okay, fine. If I can't go to space, I'm going to write about space. So I started writing. And this is this tiny little thought. Just running around writing stuff, it was mostly derivative at the start, but eventually when I was 14, I had just sat down long enough that I had produced a 134,000 word manuscript. I actually have that in my bag, which a publisher took one look at and said, we are never going to publish this. I'm so glad he did, because that writing is bad. But uh, that transitioned, that just sort of kept on going. And I was pretty soon, I was blogging, I was writing about tech, and then shit happened. So my parents went through a divorce and suddenly um, my mum with her 15,000 rupees hourly at a garment factory was left to fend for me, basically. I was supposed to survive on that. So we moved to this slum in Panipitiya. And there's this room, like, about this size, right? There's a bed in one corner. We hung a plastic sheet here. We had the gas cooker here. And that was where we lived. So for I think for five or six years, I basically slept on the floor. Um, and then, and you know, by that time, so I was doing the A-levels, I had to drop the fancy international school and all that. I had to join the local stream and pretend to be a normal human being. And, uh, you know, basically, when you're in that situation where you're thinking about whether you get to eat that night or not, or whether you can make the rent, or whether you can make the payment for this month or not, you really don't have time to be to dream fancy stuff like I'm going to be an author. So I basically flunked my A-levels. I did maths at Isipatana, failed. Uh, yeah, well, it's maths, right? That's my normal excuse. But no, I wasn't paying attention. 
um, I didn't like the teacher. I actually hated the teachers. Uh, I didn't mo like most of my classmates also. So I failed. Um, and there was this point where, see, my mother had been expecting me to go to university. And when the results came in, she was like, you, we have no future now. You realize that, right? So I did the most logical thing I could. I knew this dude called Kushan Dodangala, who was running this magazine, and he happened to work for this place called Redline. I thought, OK, I can talk. I have some awareness of what tech is, and I can the rest of it I can pick up. So I went to Majestic City, took the 138 bus, walked in and said, I want a job. And this dude looks at me from behind the table and goes, what? I said, I want a job. I said, OK, sell me something. And so I gave him this valiant pitch and I tried to sell him a processor. I said, okay, okay, how can you start on Monday? So that was my life, basically. Um, 2010, 2011, I would stand in Majestic City, that little shop every day, and sell graphics cards and laptops to people who came and people with enough money to buy them. And my friends on Facebook, why, the friends that I grew up with, were basically saying, oh, hey, I'm in front of the Eiffel Tower. Oh my god, hashtag completed, I'm lawyering up. And I'm like, well, that is my life and that I will never have again. And this is a very sad, depressed, mopey little creature. But I kept on writing through the, through all of this stuff. I just kept on blogging. I ran a blog. I started a blog called Icarus Web. Initially, I just started raging at the world. But then, as, as I found more time, my writing started to get a little bit more focused about problems that I saw going around me. And then eventually caught the attention of some people and we started writing Read Me. So I was basically at some point juggling two jobs, working 10 hours a day, and then go home and write. And this kept on unlocking doors. At some point, uh, some dude came up to me and said, I want to start a print magazine. We heard you can write. Are you interested? said, yeah. said, we'll give you starting off 100,000 bucks. I said, Bill, I'm making 20,000 here, standing here for 10 hours. For 100,000 bucks, I'll paint your house if I have to. So I jumped. And this just kept on going. Because see, um, I looked at the world around me. I thought, I'm a writer. There's no way in hell in Sri Lanka you can, you can make a living as a writer, right? Most really good people who can write in this country, they end up uh, joining in as a journalist, where they make shit money for X many number of years, they burn out, and they join the ad industry. And whether they're happy or sad or not, these up for you to decide. Uh, so I just kept on doing this. I ended up at WSR2. And there I developed an appreciation of data, of using, I was working with the data science team. I was taking lessons in programming. I realized that you know, I had this, I had enough money for the first time in my life. I had enough money to invest in education. So like Isur was showing these, these things cost about $40 per certificate. So I was taking uh, data science, astrophysics, Greek and Roman mythology, and statistics. All the things that I wanted to take in school, but I couldn't. And at some point I realized, okay, now I know enough and now I have enough time and money to sit and write a book. So I sat and wrote. Now towards, I think, until about the beginning of, uh, so I had, I had built this blog. In the middle of this, this blog had basically built itself kind of thing. Icarus Web had reached 200,000 readers in 2015. That was when it peaked, when the Rajapaksa administration was last in power. And I was one of the few people speaking out in English. There were plenty of good people talking out in Singhala. And I had a niche and a couple of hundred thousand people were reading this. And I had built this muscle without knowing it where I could just flex it and sprint for 2,000 to 4,000 words at a time. And I thought, okay, what's a novel? The novel is 60 to 80,000 words. I can write 4,000 words a week. I will break this up. I did the breakdown, okay. Here's how many days it will take me to write 80,000 words. I thought, okay, I need to learn editing. I don't know about editing. I don't know about any of this stuff. So I thought, okay, here's a month in which I will read everything that I can lay my hands on and learn editing. Um, and here's, uh, here's basically another month to, redraw the, to rewrite the novel. And I ended up with a tentative date of December 2016. And by December 2016, the draft was done. Then I started looking for publishers. And every publisher that I reached out, now by this time I had spent two years writing this damn thing and I was tired of it. 
I reached out to a couple of publishers. There's this lady from HarperCollins who was interested, a couple of local publishers here who were also interested. One of them came up to me and said, you're Sinhala, right? Why aren't you writing Sinhala? Okay, right. Okay, wonderful. Um, this other person said, uh, she, was, she was actually pretty polite, but she said, we have received your manuscript. We will send you an email in six months. Okay. Um, and this other person said, we like your story. You can write, but it's science fiction. We can't sell science fiction. Okay, fine. So at this point, I had, I had just started reading up about the process of getting published. Because that's my thing. If I don't know shit, I will go away and read something about it. And J.K. Rowling, apparently, was rejected by 33 publishing houses until the daughter of an editor saw her manuscript lying on the table, read it, and convinced her father to publish it. And that is one of the greatest literary icons of our, or any generation. Stephen King talks about how he had a nail stuck on his wall where he would hammer the rejection letters in. Eventually, he had so many rejection letters that the nail fell off the wall and he'd hang up three other nails. I thought, okay, no way in hell am I going to spend my time doing this. So I started looking for other avenues. I found Amazon. And there's this thing on Amazon where you can, if you have a Word document, you can click a couple of buttons and publish it. I was like, wow, okay, okay, what's the catch? The catch is you have to do your own covers, you have to do your own branding kind of thing, you have to act as a publisher, you have to register your ISP in the works. Right, did some reading about that, did that for my short story, that really took off well. And by the time I got to number cast, I sort of had a process. Like I have, I'm not a designer, I have no intrinsic understanding of design. So I asked my friends on Facebook to help out with me. I post up five designs, and then someone will come and say, I like this, I don't like this, I like the feature of this plus feature of this. Okay, I'll mix the two and say, okay, what do you like now? And eventually through this process of weeding out the best, I will arrive at one conclusion that turns out to be a spectacular performer. So, I'm basically here to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to talk about um, anyone, firstly, does anyone want to write here? Does anyone have a dream of putting out a novel? Anything? No? No? Wonderful. You sir are brave. You'll never make money. Okay, now that that's, now that, that obligatory step is over, let's, let's get on to the meat of it. Um, so this reached a massive, I would say a tidal wave of support. I was really grateful because by the time this came out, hundreds of people are liking it. I think about 4,000 people have read the book now. And these are 4,000 people across the world, like 80% of them are in the US, a bunch of them in Canada, Japan, Germany, and France. And I'm sitting here, a no-name writer from Sri Lanka, who has basically just uploaded a Word document. And there are like six or seven typos in the Word document, as these two keep reminding me. That's true. And it's winning awards and things of that nature. And someone came up recently and congratulated me and said, oh, congrats, dude. You've just put this novel out. You've put this out. You know, how do you do it? Like, how do you, how do you keep writing? Because I've, I've written like 20,000 words into the next novel now. Like, how do you keep writing? And I remember this thing Kalumalli said. Um, back, when I, back when he started going viral, I ended up meeting this dude. I think he's at the back there. He's at the back. I ended up meeting this dude at a tweet up uh, here, I think, um, and I said pretty much the same thing. When his videos started going viral, I said, Masang, congratulations, you're going viral, no? And he sort of thought for a second and said, Masang, it took me 10 years to go viral. You'll see that one video, you won't see the 10 years of work behind it. So I think I have, on introspection, gotten to that stage where I have this work that is going out there. And there's 10 years of just some of it is me being a dumbass and refusing to just stop writing or whatever and you know work as a I don't know what else I could do. Maybe I can dance. Maybe I can be a strip teaser, I don't know. Um, but there is there is a significant um, decade or so of consistent work that I put into it. And in doing this what I found is this. Firstly, none of us are experts at anything, right? You know how people say that dude is a born writer or he's a born mathematician or something. Bullshit. Absolutely bullshit. We do not come out of the womb knowing anything. We don't know how to write. They're basically blank little potato shaped things running around and pooping. That's what a baby is, right? 
but all of us can learn. And the one thing that we are taught in the school education system is touching on something Isura said. We are given this structure. You follow this, 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 and this. You try to get uh, three years. You try to go to university. You try to get laid. You have a family, a job, the wife, the 2.5 kids, and the statistical average is 2.5 kids. Uh, and you have, you have the car. Eventually, you get the car. You sign a lease that puts you in 10 years of debt. And this whole thing is laid out for you. But what I find is that this system results in producing an average of, you know, and a decent average. The average Sri Lankan is actually pretty decent. Some of them are misogynist, but the average Sri Lankan no, can, can read and process English. The average Sri Lankan is quite bilingual. And the average Sri Lankan is good, but all of us, none of us are average Sri Lankans. There is this study done by the US Air Force when they hired a designer to create a perfect seat for a fighter pilot. So what these guys did was they measured the arm lengths and the leg lengths and the spine lengths of all the pilots in the airbase. And they said, here's the average. And they created one seat. And every pilot hated this seat because it fit none of them. And that is exactly what our generic education system does. It creates this thing that sort of fits 90% of the way. But the rest of the time, if you're an outlier, if you, even if you're normal, you don't fit, period. So what do you do for this? The great, the whole point of this, the great myth of this, is that we are taught that our education stops after A levels, you get a degree, and you stop there. It doesn't. Each of us sitting here, if you can throw 10,000 hours, and this is the subject of much research, if you can put 10,000 hours into something, you can be good at it. If you want to write a book, you spend an hour each day writing a book, you, you write a hundred words a day, right? You write for a thousand days, you end up with a hundred thousand word book, which is a large fantasy epic, and that's still faster than Arundhati Roy's writing. Uh, if you write 200 words a day, you can write a book in, what, roughly one and a half years. If you write 500 words a day, and 500 words a day for the record is sitting down for one and a half hours. If you sit down for one and a half hours and you work on something that you're really passionate about, that's really all you need. Within a year, you have the book out. And this same theory applies to pretty much anything you want to do. If you want to go to the gym and you want to get a body, I should at some point. Uh, you go to the gym for one hour a day, every single day, right? At the end of a year, man, you're going to be able to punch someone and break their skull. If you want to paint, and if you want to learn to paint, you spend one hour a day just doing that repetitively, you end up getting better at it. So first takeaway, anyone can learn anything. If you really want to learn something, if you really have a passion that you really want to pursue, you have a day job, yes, we all do. We all need to make money. Um, and we all need to go home and make sure that our families are fed and cared for. If you can spare an hour a day, you can pretty much do anything. You can learn anything you want, trust me. Um, I'm here because I have taken, well, if you read my education history on LinkedIn now, it says data science from Johns Hopkins University, statistics from Duke, astrophysics at ANU, all the blah. That is basically built off the one hour day thing. When I started, I had even less than what most of you start out with. You, you consider to me, you have a significant leap ahead. The second thing is this whole follow your passions thing. Now, I've been going around to a lot of the entrepreneur startup stuff because I was a tech journalist and I had to cover that stuff. And I find two things. One, they say, put your balls to the wall and basically leave your day job and go pursue your passions um, or, you're, or you're this boring office drone. Well, you know what? Not really. Most of us don't have that luxury, right? That is not practical advice. That is very practical advice if you have a mother and a father who have a lovely mansion and you got the car and you got the girlfriend and you got everything sorted out, even the dog. Practically, there was, in the 70s, people had hobbies. In the 60s, 70s, and 50s, people had hobbies. People would make houses of cards. They would do carpentry. As we grow towards the new millennium, hobbies dropped completely. They were this creation, 
creating something was basically dropped by sitting in front of a TV screen consuming a TV series. TV series are fantastic, Narcos is brilliant. But if you can swap that out, then I submit to you that you can actually create something, you can follow a passion, whatever it is, playing guitar, creating a business, whatever it is. Just swap out some of the time that you spend consuming into creating. And at the end of the day, you're going to be a hell of a lot happier. Most of, and the third thing is, the myth of success. Because uh, there's this wonderful data scientist called Christian Rudder, who points out that our history is basically the history of outliers. We look at the Julius Caesars, we look at the Elon Musks, we look at the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Bill Gates. These are people for whom everything, in a sense, worked out straight, right? Um, highly intelligent people who had a certain background, um, and for whom the market also worked out of so many other forces, maybe the climate and even the weather worked out for them. And these are the outliers that we try to measure ourselves up with. Do not measure yourself up with the outliers. As an author, I can measure myself by Stephen King and J.K. Rowling. But that is unreasonable, that is stupid. Because at the end of the day, these people are outliers. In Stephen King's case, the guy has written 80 books. Right? And that's a career spanning 50 or 60 years. There is no basis of measuring myself to that man. In J.K. Rowling's case, she wrote a fantastic book which sold 3,000 copies in Britain until Scholastic picked it up in the US, put a load of marketing money there, and voila, international bestseller. So that relies on a lot of factors working out, but there is one standard by which we can measure ourselves consistently, and that is ourselves. Simple philosophy, very simple. Um, it's called Kaizen. A good friend of mine pointed this out to me. Um, and he said, it doesn't matter who you're running against. It doesn't matter your past, your future, all of that crap. All that matters is, are you 1% better than who you were yesterday? Are you even the tiniest bit faster? Are you slightly smarter? Are you a slightly more mature person? than you are today. And I think most of us have had this moment where we look back and go, okay, that person that I was at 18 or whatever, I'm so much more mature. I can do more stuff. So his theory is, can you make that a conscious process? Can you improve by 1%? Because if you improve by 1%, those gains stack up like compound interest on a fund. And eventually you're trailblazing. I'm still hungry. Yeah, that's the one thing the 1% doesn't work against. Uh, so my story is essentially just an outlier, which I presented to you as a baseline, um, to point out that most of you who are here are wearing decent clothes. You're not in need of, you're not in desperate need of food. You don't have to struggle for water. You have a certain background, perhaps not all of us, not all of us are of equal stages. But you have enough of something to get yourself started on whatever it is that you want to do. And the last thing that I would leave, like to leave you with is this favorite quote of mine that uh, I applied to myself when my father split, when the suicide and stuff took over. There's this part in the Lord of the Rings movie where Frodo says to Gandalf, I wish none of this had ever happened. I wish the ring had never come to the Shire. Because by now, Frodo has been through hell. He's in the mines of Moria, he's left behind his wonderful home, he has lost everything. And Gandalf responds saying, that is not for them, so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All you have to do is decide what to do with the time that is given to you. We all have one resource to spend, right? It's not money. It's nothing else, right? Money you can earn back, respect, trust, joy, love, everything else you can earn back. Time ticks forward, like tick, 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 it always goes forward. You're never going to get those seconds back. So all you really have to do is figure out how you're going to spend the next five minutes, the next day, the next week, the next month, and then figure out a practical way of doing it. Spend an hour a day. Spend an hour on what you're passionate on and go do it. Trust me. All of you can. And that is pretty much all the wisdom that I have to share.